Hi, web families. It's so great to see you online. Um, I hope, you know, for the families that were able to join us in person for move-in and orientation weekend that you were excited to be on campus. We're certainly excited from the school administration side to finally be fully open again after a long kind of 18 months. Um, there was a lot of excitement and certainly the heat was on high as everything was happening. Um, so we're happy that you can join us online. So good evening or good morning from where you're logging in from. Um, my name is Jen Liu, Director of Parent Relations and a very proud graduate of the Web Schools Class of 2005. Um, so just a few nuts and bolts as we're listening to um, Dr. Mark Brackett's presentation. If you have any questions or any comments, feel free to use the chat box. Um, and at the end of his presentation, Dr. Smith and myself will be uh, moderating kind of a Q&A and take some time to do that. Um, and without further ado, so we don't keep you guys way too long, because um, it is a Sunday or a Monday morning from where you are, I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Teresa Smith, our incredible associate head of schools, who has an amazing mind and an amazing kind of passion for education, um, and is a great role model for, for me and a lot of people who work here. Um, so, Dr. Smith, over to you. That's very generous. Thank you, Jen. Um, all right, I'm excited to introduce uh, Dr. Mark Brackett. So I'm just going to jump right in. He had a wonderful faculty staff session with us. Uh, was it earlier this week, last week? Um, and we're just so happy to have him here. All right, so Mark Brackett, PhD, is the author of Permission to Feel, and he's the founding director of the Yale Center for Emotional Intelligence, and he's a professor in the Child Study Center at the Yale School of Medicine at Yale University. His grant-funded research focuses on the role of emotions and emotional intelligence in learning, decision-making, creativity, relationship quality, and mental health as well as the measurement of emotional intelligence and the influence of emotional intelligence training on children's and adults' health, performance, and workplace performance and climate. So pretty much life. <laughs> Mark has published 150 scholarly articles and has received numerous awards, including the Joseph E. Vins Award for his research on social and emotional learning and an honorary doctorate from Manhattanville College. He's also on the board of directors for the Collaborative for Academic, Social, and Emotional Learning. Mark is the lead developer of RULER, a systematic evidence-based approach to social and emotional learning that has been adopted by over 3,000 public charter and private schools at through high schools across the US and in other countries, including Australia, China, England, Italy, Morocco, Mexico, and Spain. Research shows that RULER boosts academic performance, decreases school problems like bullying, enriches classroom climates, reduces teacher stress and burnout, and enhances teacher instructional practices. Mark regularly consults with large companies on best practices for integrating the principles of emotional intelligence into training and product design, and he's the co-founder of OD Life Lab, a corporate learning firm that develops innovative digital learning systems for emotional intelligence. So we're excited. He speaks to thousands of people, tens of thousands of people every year, including the White House, the U.S. Department of Education, Justice, Defense, and more. So we're excited to have him. Uh, and as a small fun fact, Mark also holds a fifth degree black belt in Hapkido, a Korean martial art. So I'm going to turn it over. Please welcome Dr. Mark Brackett. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, and it's a pleasure to be back uh, with your school. The um, I can't remember. It feels you know, during these times when it's the summer, you're like, when was that last presentation? <laughs> I think it was it was last week, though, wasn't it? It was that it was it was recent. We both can agree to that. <laughs> um, anyway, I know that you know for people here in the United States, Sunday night presentation, like my goodness, thank you for the courage, for uh, for joining, you know, and for those of you who are um, joining from other countries. Uh, especially over in Asia. Thank you for joining uh, in your early, early morning. So you heard enough about my background. Um, I thought I would just jump right into my presentation. So here we go. I'm going to bring up my slides. Just give me one second. Give me two seconds. I think I had multiple ones open. Here we go. There we go. 
Okay. So again, good evening, everybody. And um, for the next hour or so, we're going to be talking quite a bit about emotions. So I hope you're ready for that. Um, the title of my presentation is Permission to Feel. And uh, obviously that comes from the title of my book. I just want to start by a lot of people at the end, they're like, well, where do I get more information? Or how do I stay connected? So I thought I would just give that away up front. So the best way to stay connected with me personally or to learn more about the science and practice of emotional intelligence is just to go directly to my website. You can sign up for newsletters, get free readings. I even have a virtual book club. Um, and then in addition, if you want to learn more about our school-based work, you can go to the Ruler site or um, follow us on social media. So I always like to start presentations with quotes. Um, this is the one that I've been using lately because I think it resonates with so many of us given that we've gone through this pandemic for 18 months. And here we go. And once the storm is over, you won't remember how you made it through, how you managed to survive. You won't even be sure whether the storm is really over. But one thing is certain. When you come out of the storm, you won't be the same person who walked in by Haruki Murakami. So let me ask you all to just take a moment and think about how does that resonate with you? What does it make you think about as parents of students who are in school, starting school right now, having lived through last year, being a pretty difficult year for most families and in most schools. What comes to mind for you? Now, I'm someone who likes to use the chat on Zoom. Um, I know most of you are familiar with it because we've been using Zoom for so long now. And so if you're comfortable, I'm gonna ask you to put your ideas in the chat, um, but not required. So I'm gonna give everybody just a few seconds. As you think about this quote, what resonates with you? I'll just share, you know, for me, um, I did a research study on gratitude right before um, this summer. And I was really curious, you know, what are, the, what are people grateful for during a pandemic? And what I found was that people said the things that they always said, family, friends, finances, food. Um, but I realized that no one was thinking outside the box. For example, tonight, interestingly enough, I had, I had the opportunity to go out for dinner before this presentation, given the time. And, you know, I was sitting at the restaurant thinking, my goodness, all these waiters who didn't have job, waitresses who didn't have jobs, I'm grateful for them, people who deliver our mail, educators, um, doctors and nurses. So for me coming out of this, um, Gratitude has just become kind of more salient. What about for you? So this is a conversation about emotional intelligence. And um, I thought I would do a little bit of teaching about emotions. So this is our signature tool. It's uh, a deceptively simple tool called the mood meter. And I'm going to just share with you a little bit about it right now. So on the X axis, it says the word pleasantness. Think about that for a minute. Pleasantness. Minus five. You're at the most unpleasant place you've ever been. Plus five. You are in the best possible mood you've ever been in. And then on the Y axis, it says the word energy. Minus five, you're just feeling really low energy. Plus five, you got so much energy, you can't contain it. And then what we do is we cross our axes to create the four quadrants of the mood meter. We have yellow, red, blue, and green. I'm going to ask all of you to take a moment and just think about it. What color are you in today? And let's just start there. If you're comfortable using the chat, I want to make sure everybody's able to use the chat. So I'm going to type my color in first. I'm actually in kind of green. Everyone else? If you're, if it's... T 
Teresa's in yellow. Convocation was inspiring. Thank you, Teresa. How about others? What's your color tonight or this morning? We have another green. We got some yellow. Got another green. Got some yellows. Having students on campus has been a nice thing. Nice. So I'm going to ask all of you to take a moment and try to convert your feeling color, the quadrant, to a specific feeling word. Can everyone just take a moment and think about the word that best describes how they're feeling? What word might that be? And maybe you're struggling, I'm not sure. What we find in our research is that people do have a hard time finding those precise words. Um, we're used to, at least in English, saying things like fine, okay, busy. Sometimes you don't even get, right, if you're on children, uh, you get a grunt. You don't even get a word. Um, and so part of my presentation is going to be to challenge all of you to think differently about the power of emotion words. This is your cheat sheet. Um, very proud to say that this, my book, Permission to Feel, um, actually is being translated to 20 languages. So um, most languages, at least, that are commonly spoken, whether it be Chinese or Korean or Japanese or Spanish, Italian, French, German, Croatian, Arabic, um, you can see this mood mirror translated into those languages. And so I ask all of you, now that you see the mood meter, is it more helpful when you when you see the words there? Does it feel, oh wow, I, that is the word, that is the feeling. Most people say, yeah, it's actually easier to recognize, right, the feeling from the mood meter compared to like having to come up with a word without it being in front of me. As you know, life is an emotional roller coaster. Um, I know for me, you know, being a leader of a large center at a university, we have 60 full-time staff working at the Center for Emotional Intelligence. It's been a tough year um, trying to manage people from a distance from my kitchen counter. And so I've done some research to try to understand what are the emotions that people are feeling these days. And what we know is that our children, this is full range of children, like elementary, middle, and high school, the number one emotion that they say they feel, frustrated, anxious, stressed. What's interesting to me is that about five years ago, I did a national study here in the United States with high schools, asking students how they felt. The top emotions were tired, bored, and stressed. And it's changed. Now it's frustration, anxious, and bored. Um, I'm just curious, do these emotions that kids say they're feeling resonate with you? Does that give me a yes in the chat box if this kind of makes sense to you? Sort of the emotional state, you know, of children. Really interested in how adults feel. And so I've done so many studies on the emotions of adults. And interestingly enough, a couple of years ago, stress was the number one emotion. And what I find really interesting is that in today's world, anxiety is the number one emotion. So let's think about this for a minute. We've got a world filled with adults who are anxious and worried and stressed and overwhelmed. And we've got kids who are frustrated, stressed, overwhelmed, 
and bored. Um, that's a pretty kind of dangerous combination of feelings, no? And so, you know, one of the things that we talk a lot about in our work with schools and with parents is this combination of emotions. And so, to me, as you, as you look at the data, what you see is that we got a lot of people living in the red and blue. Right? A lot of people feeling stressed and overwhelmed, and people in the blue feeling tired and exhausted and lonely. Now, when we ask people, how do you want to feel? Nobody says any of those red and blue emotions. They all say the yellow ones, happy, excited, fulfilled, calm. And so I think the big question is, well, firstly, what's the goal? How do we go from red and blue to yellow and green? Or is that even the right question? And one of the challenges I think we have in our society is a term that's called toxic positivity. This idea that we have to strive to be happy all the time. But the goal is to always be happy. Now, I don't know about you, but um, that's challenging. Um, trying to be happy all the time, um, that's a lot of effort. And in today's world, when there is a lot of uncertainty, trying to be happy um, is kind of complicated. And so I've come up with this idea over the last many, many years around permission to feel. And so I share that with you because I think the first step in any work on emotional intelligence is that we have to give ourselves and everyone that we love and care about the permission to be their true full feeling selves. And so that means that there's no such thing as a good or a bad emotion. That's complicated because in many societies, including ours here, anxiety is a bad emotion. Happiness is a good emotion. But what if we were to drop those labels and just say, emotions are experiences and everyone's gonna feel all of them. And it's okay. It's okay to be your true, full feeling self. So over the years I've done research on this and I've asked people, well, what are the words that describe the people who give you that permission to feel? And here's what they say. Just take a moment and look at that. Empathic, non-judgmental, validating, supportive, compassionate, unconditional love, patient, open-minded, attentive, accepting. Resonate with you? I always like to ask parents, so, during this pandemic, during these difficult times, how much self-compassion have you had? Self-empathy, non-judgmentalness, self-accepting, self-caring, self-encouraging, patient. Then I ask you the same, how much have you been that with your children? I know that what I've heard and what I've seen in our research is that during the pandemic, people's fuses have gotten shorter, people's tempers have gotten bigger, <laughs> uh, or their tolerance, I should say, uh, has gotten crunched. And so many people struggle, you know, with this. Now, you might be saying, all right, so what's the science? This guy is a professor at a place like Yale, what's the science to prove that all this matters? And so there are five reasons why I believe every parent, every teacher needs to care about emotions. The first is attention, memory, and learning. So none of you know me that well, but I was a student who didn't do very well in school. I had terrible anxiety as a child. Um, 
and I didn't get very good grades. And the, um, the question was, were my grades an indicator of my intelligence or my capabilities? And I'm here to tell you the answer is no, because I am a pretty smart guy. The challenge was, is that I was experiencing very strong emotions and I had no skills to deal with them. And so what we find in our research is that when you have the ability to recognize and manage those feelings, guess what? They have much less power over your academics. The second, decision-making. We like to think that we're rational creatures, that we make all of our decisions through, you know, through our cognitive rational side of our brain. But the truth is, much of our decision-making comes from our feelings. But we're not conscious of it. Has anyone here ever gotten into an argument with their kid and like, I can't take it anymore. I'm going to lose it with you. If you do one with this thing one more time, like this is, it's over. And then maybe you punish the child or maybe you don't buy them the thing at the store when they're having the tantrum, whatever it might be. And how many of us in that moment say, oh my goodness, my feelings are what is driving my decision to say the unkind thing or to not to purchase the thing. We don't operate that way. What happens is that our emotions mostly subconsciously influence our judgments. The third, relationships. Think about this for a minute. Emotions are signals to approach or avoid. Emotions are signals to approach or avoid. Maybe some of you have had, you know, with your, stu your, your own children, your kid comes home from school or it's the weekend or it's the summer and they're misbehaving and they're, you know, um, screaming. And you, right, as the parent, right, um, kind of oftentimes like what my parents would do is say, they go to your room. Who do you think you are talking to me that way? Um, or I get punished sometimes for my behavior. I think the challenge with that is that, right, emotions are signals. So the yelling, the screaming, the crying is never saying, don't speak to me, don't talk to me, punish me. It's saying, I need help. And so I think one of the most important messages I could ever convey is that when a child is having strong emotions, it's always the job of the parent, the adult, to approach, not to avoid. The fourth, physical and mental health. You know, it's very interesting when I work with schools like yours, People want to be highly, you know, academics are really important. And I understand that because they are important. Um, but what I'm here to tell you is that the mental health of college students has been diminishing over the last decade. As a matter of fact, uh, among Yale undergraduates, nearly 50% of our students are being treated for mental health challenges. And so I just share that with you because I think everyone's goal, I think the school that your children are at, the goal, I think your goal as a parent, right, is yes, I want my child to be academically gifted and academically successful, but I also want them to have good mental health and, and self-esteem. Does this resonate with people? I hope. Um, the last is performance and creativity. And so what I mean by that specifically is that, you know, having worked with so many students over the course of my career, what I've noticed and witnessed is that many people don't reach their full potential, not because of their academics um, or their academic ability, but because they can't deal with their feelings. 
They can't deal with feedback. Um, they can't deal with the overwhelm, you know, of being in school. They can't deal with the feedback, the frustration towards achieving a goal. And oftentimes it's the emotion and the lack of skill in regulating the emotion that derails them from achieving the goal. It's not their actual creativity or their skill. Does this resonate with people? So whenever people ask me, you know, do emotions matter? Obviously I could speak about this for weeks because there's endless research to support that emotions are just critical to all aspects of everyday life and functioning. Let me just pause there for a minute because um, I've been doing a lot of talking. Um, are there any questions about any of the science behind this work? Any questions? You can type it into the chat room. Questions? Comments? Thoughts? All right, this is a quiet group, so I will continue. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Teresa. Don't be shy. I'm just, I'm just a friendly professor. Um, I'm eager to answer any questions you might have about the science of emotion or the skills. So there are two ways I like to think about people. And what I've come to the conclusion about is that there are people who are kind of emotion judges. And then there are kind of people who are more like emotion scientists. So take a look at these two lists and ask yourself, do you see yourself as the curious explorer? Or do you see yourself as someone kind of that's closed and critical? Yes, yeah, so Bob, great question about teenagers and um, have more or less vulnerability to anxiety and frustration compared to college students. You know, the frontal lobe is developing way past even college years. It gets up until the mid twenties. Um, and I think What's most important about that is that's where the regulation stuff comes in, that it becomes easier to regulate um, as your frontal lobe gets developed. Um, it's you know, that amygdala, limbic system, you know, is where our emotions are kind of coming from, based on lots of other things too. But um, and so. The answer is one that is, it's kind of yes and no. The yes is that it's harder to regulate and you get better at regulating as you age and develop. But what research is showing these days, you know, is that the amount of uncertainty, you know, that students are kind of seeing in the world um, is creating a, um, a ubiquitousness or ubiquity. Um, I'm not using that word correctly right now, but you get what I'm saying. Um, is that anxiety appears to be ubiquitous is my, what I really want to say from younger children. So, um, I think the most recent research that I read was about a 20% or so increase in um, five to 10 year olds or 11 year olds, and then 12 to 18 year olds been about a 40% increase, um, in getting treatment for, um, anxiety and depression. So going back to our slides here, my question for all of you is, um, where do you see yourself as a parent? Are you the scientist explorer? Are you the judge? 
when your kid doesn't deal with their emotions well, do you say, go to your room? Or do you say, oh my goodness, honey, let's talk more? Question, do college students suffer from mental health issues at Yale? Do, do parents or themselves push themselves to achieve? Um, the answer is uh, both. Um, we do know, we do have that helicoptering um, and the pressure. So a lot of college students are suffering from the pressure of their parents to succeed. Um, here's an interesting study. So when I asked hundreds of undergraduates about their feelings, the number one emotion they said they were feeling was stress. And then I had them do some journaling about the reasons for their stress. Do you know, anyone want to guess what the number one emotion actually was? It wasn't stress. That's what they were just saying. Again, even Yale undergraduates vocabulary for emotions, not great. What might be the number one emotion? Somebody says fear. Anything else? Come on, everybody. It's a fun game. What do you think the number one emotion was? Anxiety. Anyone else? What were the themes coming up? Tired. Loneliness. Everyone ready? The number one emotion was, I'm gonna type it in the box. Envy. All of the things that were stressing students out were things related to social comparisons. This mother is famous and that kid is that, that, and that person is going to have all the opportunities in the world. This person's father is a billionaire. They're going to have all, they never have to worry about anything. This one has this, this one has that, this one has that. They were just endlessly comparing themselves to other students. And so it brings up an interesting question, doesn't it? What do you do with all the envy? Um, a lot of people are saying yoga is the answer to envy. Mindfulness. And all these things can help. But, you know, in my work, what I argue is that you have to name it to tame it. You really have to be specific in your feeling in order to know what to do with that feeling. And that leads to the skills of emotional intelligence. So there are five skills. Um, that help us all to become emotionally intelligent. We call them the ruler skills. And we're going to go through those one by one. Oh, no, we're not. Sorry, that was a cheat. I forgot I was giving you a quiz. So before we go there, um, I don't want to give you a quiz yet. Recognizing emotions. Let's think about that for a minute. Being aware of our own and others' emotions. Think about that for a minute. Self-aware, other-aware. Why am I feeling the way I do? Why are you feeling the way to do? The way you do. That's the understanding of emotion. Labeling emotion. Well, is it anxiety? Is it stress? Is it frustration? Is it overwhelm? So I'm going to ask you right now, I'm going to give you just two to make it simpler because um, it's late and it's early. What is the psychological difference between anxiety and stress? What's the difference? I'm anxious, I'm stressed. What's the difference? I'm going to give all of you, I'm going to give yourself two minutes to just think about that. What's the difference between anxiety and stress? Please take two minutes. What is the difference? And if you know the difference, you can type it right in. This is a competition. The winner gets lunch with Teresa. Just kidding. 
And it's lunch with Jen. Lunch with Jen and Teresa. Anxiety is more related to the future. Nice. What else? Lunch on the left. Stress causes anxiety. That's an interesting way to think about it. What do other people think? Anxiety for unpredictable, stressing for the things on the shoulder. Nice. I'm glad we're getting some participation. So anxiety is about uncertainty. I can't make an accurate prediction about what's going to happen. <gasps> I'm feeling anxious. Stress is when we have too many demands and not enough resources. Stress is I have too much to do and I just can't get it done. I can't get it done. That's what causes stress. Better said, it's what causes distress. There is positive stress. The stress, like when you're in sports and you're being pushed, that's called you stress. So R U L, recognizing, understanding, labeling emotions. The E, expressing emotions, knowing how and when to express our emotions with different people across different contexts. Right here, we have a very diverse group of educators I and mean, parents. People from all over, well, educators and parents. People from right, the United States and from Asia and elsewhere. Right, there are different rules for expressing emotions across the world. Is there one correct way to greet somebody? The answer is no. Um, in my martial art, which is Korean, right? I go to Korea, a little town called Daegu. Uh, Mark san, people bow. I go to New York City, people give a handshake that's very strong. Um, other places wave. The rules are different everywhere. Still, everybody greets. Is there a correct one? No. The last skill, emotion regulation. We're going to talk more about that in just a minute because we're going to spend a lot of time on that. So emotion regulation, self-regulation, how I manage my own feelings. Do I, you know, we, when we went out for dinner, my family, everybody said they wanted ice cream. I was like, okay, well, you can have ice cream, but I'm not having any ice cream. And um, I was like, come on, Mark, you know, you come on, have some ice cream. I'm like, no, um, I'm good. And like the temptation, right? Can I, Mark, can I not? Mark, don't do it. Um, that's self-regulation. And sometimes we fail at self-regulation. Has anyone here failed at managing your own emotions during the pandemic at some point or another? Come on, let me get a honesty in the chat. Anyone just like kind of have a meltdown or just have a very difficult time dealing with your feelings? Yes, with exclamation points many times. Definitely, yes, thank you. So that's the self piece. It's like what I do with my feelings. And then there is the co-regulation, like what we do with parents, a back and forth between two people. So helping our child to regulate their emotions. I love this quote by the late Maya Angelou. As you grow older, you will discover that you've got two hands. 
one for helping yourself and the other for helping others. So that leads to the endless amount of work that we can all do to better manage our feelings. And I call these the big seven strategies. The first is basically what I've been talking about. It's accepting that all your feelings are okay, that you don't necessarily have to shift your feeling. You can be with your feeling. The second is physiological regulation. Sometimes we need to do a breathing exercise to help us down-regulate. The third, we'll call it physical self-care. Getting enough sleep, eating healthy foods, exercise, all which people say, how does that, what does that have to do with emotion regulation? The truth is it has a lot to do with emotion regulation because it's what's underneath, right? If you don't get enough sleep, your brain has a difficult time being present. Do you know that when you exercise, you're kinder to people? Go figure. Endorphins, endorphins get released when you're kind to people. Um, more oxytocin is in the air. Psychological self-care. Taking time to just be still, to take a walk, to doodle, to play a game. Social connection, building and maintaining healthy relationships, cognitive strategies, managing your self-talk. How many of us have negative self-talk? How do we switch it to more positive self-talk? And then routines, just bedtime, wake up time, break time, meal time. Are you kind of setting up your day to be successful, to help you manage feelings. So we're gonna practice a few of these tonight. I know maybe you didn't expect to be guided through some practices, but I think we should do it. So I think it's important to kind of break the stereotype around mindfulness and breathing. Oftentimes, people say things like, isn't that religion or something of the like, and I say, I don't know, but every Jewish person I met, every Buddhist person I met, every Catholic person I met, every person across the world that I met does breathe. So it's not religion. It's, you know, we're not really taught how to breathe properly because it's just not something we think about. But when we're anxious and overwhelmed, our breathing changes. We start breathing. <gasps> <sighs> we pant. And when we're panting, it activates the fight flight area of our brain, which puts us into survival mode, not learning mode. So with that said, everyone, I know this might be a little awkward, but we're just going to try it out. Everybody get good posture in your seats. Take a nice long inhale. And a nice long exhale. I'm going to share my secret strategy for when I have a hard time falling asleep or when I can't get my brain to settle down. And it goes like this. We say the word in and out. Then we say the word deep and slow. Then we say the word calm and ease. Then we put a smile on our face and we say release at the end. Let's just try it. No judgment. Here we go. In and out and deep and slow and calm. and ease. Breathe in and smile. 
and release. Very simple, simple breathing. Just repeating some words to help your brain go from having a lot of chatter to being still. What research shows is that these kinds of exercises are helpful for our mental health, our physical health, um, from improved respiratory and cardiovascular function to greater well-being. Social connection. You know, it's interesting. Everyone here has a need to be seen, to belong, to have their needs met. And you should know this, that the mere presence of a caring adult reduces the effects of stress. What that means is that your facial expression, your body language, your vocal tone as a parent directly impacts the physiology and the psychology of your children. And so we just need to know that, that we are a strategy in and of ourself when we are calm and helping to co-regulate. A few other things. We often think that venting to other people can be helpful. Like, I can't take it anymore. This is too much. But what research shows is the opposite. It actually drives people away. What does help is sharing the thing that's bothering you, but asking people for their perspective on it. And by getting people to provide some perspective taking, it helps you to not only build trust with that person, but it helps you to problem solve about the thing that you're having a difficult time about. We say try going from blaming to reframing. It's easy to, I mean, I don't know about you, but I do this all the time. Why'd you leave the door open? And why'd you do this? And I thought you said you were going to do this. Any blamers here? Does anybody ever notice themselves? Like when things go wrong, sometimes you end up blaming someone else for it. Come on. I can't be the only person. And so, um, guilty, yes. Even when you like, I mean, here's an example. You go out for, you know, we're at the ice cream place. I'm not going to eat it. Then I take a bite of the, uh, I take some ice cream. I'm like, you know, it's your fault that I'm eating this ice cream. It's like, it's your fault that I'm eating the ice cream. Um, yes, it is very easy to point the figure. <laughs> yes, Teresa is going to need to get out of jail card free. I've never blamed my husband for anything. I want to also share something called positive empathy. That engaging in positive empathy actually is a healthy strategy. Trying to find the ways to celebrate other people's accomplishments, not just your own. We tend to be very empathic when things go wrong. Oh my goodness, I'm so sorry this happened. But how empathic are we to positive things? How much do we embellish them? Not enough. The third that we're going to talk about is as a parent, is your self-talk. Here's the reason why your self-talk matters. Because your kids are listening to you and they're watching you. And so my mother, for example, she had this famous saying, which was, I'm having a nervous breakdown. Whenever something would go wrong in our house, my mother would say, I'm having a nervous breakdown. And that was basically um, my mother's way of communicating. I don't want to talk to you anymore. I can't take it anymore. I'm going up to my room. Leave me alone. And so not the best self-talk strategy uh, for a variety of reasons. But nevertheless, a couple of years ago, I was really stressed out and someone said, I'm, I'm having a breakdown. I literally became my mother like that. 
Now, I share this with you because many people grow up with a lot of negative self-talk. People say you're too fat or you're too skinny or we get bullied because of our race, our sexual orientation, our gender, um, our height, our weight. I mean, the list goes on. And I think the problem that we have is that we don't intervene early to help our children decipher the stories that they're telling themselves about themselves. And in my opinion, it is the most important thing we can do. And that is helping kids monitor their self-talk. And that can be things like, Mark, you can get through this. Mark, take the high road. Um, extraordinarily helpful if it's real. Reappraisal is like that reframing. It's like, can I look at this through a different perspective? Can I look at this through another lens? Is there another way that I could see this? Very, very helpful when you're experiencing a lot of strong emotions. Managing life smartly. What does that mean? Well, thinking about all the different aspects of your day and making sure they work together. Are you taking breaks between meetings? I have a rule now. I refuse, try to refuse, hour-long meetings. 50 minutes. That way I have 10 minutes to stretch, go for a glass of water, use the restroom. These back-to-back -back meetings over and over again are killer. Does that resonate with anybody? Like, you need space, especially in these Zoom meetings. Next is thinking about being a preventionist. Are we surrounding ourselves with the people who bring out the best in us? Or are we surrounding ourselves around people who are bringing the worst out in us? When it comes time for the news, there's a lot of things we have to be aware of in the world. but. Do we need to watch the news all day long and be on social media all day long? No, it's all repeated anyway. When I take a moment to ask everybody to just breathe in and breathe out and be still for a minute. One of the things that we help parents think about a lot in this work is being their best selves. And I'd like you to take a moment and think about, as a parent, as a teacher, as a leader, I want to be experienced as a person who has these qualities. What are those qualities? Try to take this seriously. My best self as a parent has these qualities. What are those qualities? And if you're comfortable, put a few in the chat, please. What are the words that come to mind for you as the ideal parent who's being their best self? <laughs> Thank you, Jen. Good listener. Calm. Good navigator. Nice. Listening. Empathizing. Encouraging. Inspiring. Nice adjectives. Listening. Supportive. So during the pandemic, I asked thousands of people this question. Interestingly enough, patient came up as really top of the line, compassionate, caring, understanding, creative. Resonate with you? I don't know about you, but I definitely need to be more patient. My threshold has gotten shorter and shorter and shorter. I'm not used to working from home. 
It's been tough. So I wanted to share with you what I think are these four steps to each of you kind of being a more emotionally intelligent parent. And then we'll take questions and um, try to think about ways to bring these skills to our lives every day. So your child comes home from school. It's the summer. It's the weekend. I hate school. I'm never going back to school again. Hopefully they don't say that obviously here but it does happen right even the best of schools have that experience so the first question to ask yourself as the parent is like is this the best time to really deal with this i mean am i am i as the parent hungry do i have privacy is my child um hungry Be aware of what you're bringing to the situation. How are you feeling as the parent? What are the nonverbals you're communicating? Like if you're in a bad mood and your kid comes home and starts saying, I hate this and I don't want to do this. How does that make you feel? Can you pause? <sighs> Take the breath. Deactivate. and be in that calm place before you say or do anything. Maybe you see your best self. So as you can see here, the first step in kind of applying emotional intelligence to parenting or partnering or teaching or leading is all about the self. How am I feeling? Am I triggered? Can I deactivate so that I can be my best self and be present? The second step is to explore. You want to lead with compassion and empathy. Remember the mere presence is helpful. Approach with welcoming facial expressions and a calm voice. Right, the goal is to be that scientist and not the judge. Use gentle exploration. Give your child undivided attention. Listen for the story and validate. We always want to avoid saying, why are you angry? Why are you sad? Why are you frustrated? Kind of break the habit of saying what you think your child is feeling. Find out what they're actually feeling. Is it anger? That's about injustice. Is it frustration? That's about block goals. Is it disappointment? That's about unmet expectations. Is it anxiety? That's about uncertainty. Is it stress? That's about having too many demands and not enough resources. Step three is strategize. You're going to coach your child using a range of thought and action strategies. Maybe it's breathing. Maybe it's a little positive self-talk. Maybe it's let's go for a little walk and have a snack. Let's do something fun. Let's do some creative problem solving around this. Remember, what's most important is to be the learner, not the knower. Remember, the strategy that might work best for you might not work best for them. And remember, you have to allow the strategy. Maybe it's music and you don't like the music. Well, if that music helps them, can you allow it? And then ideally, you're working with your child on a short-term and a long-term strategy. Okay. I may need to just breathe to deactivate in the moment. And then I might need to like talk it out to really problem solve, to figure out a solution. And I think very importantly, you got to think about the obstacles. So for example, um, if you're a parent and you're having difficulty regulating with your child in the morning, is it because you're not getting enough sleep? And the last step here is a big one. It's following up. Um, oftentimes, once kids are calm, once things seem to be quote unquote back to normal, we tend to kind of ignore it. I'm gonna encourage you to go back and ask your child some questions. 
like I'm just curious, you know, the other day you were feeling really anxious about this. How's it going? How are you feeling these days? Is the strategy that we worked on together helpful, unhelpful? What can we do differently? All right, so that's the four steps. And if you do these four steps, you're gonna have perfect parenting skills. Not quite, but I think it will be enormously helpful to you to kind of think about this, right? First, it's not about getting my child to deregulate or dysregulate or deactivate. The first step is really to make sure that I'm being 100% present with my kid which means that the first step is the adult's responsibility. The second step is to what? Explore, find out what they're feeling. The third step is to strategize. And then this fourth step is obviously the follow-up. So I'm gonna ask all of you to participate in this right now. I want you to think about all the strategies that we just discussed tonight. Is there one new strategy that you can commit to using immediately? Remember, we talked about mindful breathing, positive self-talk, connecting, labeling our feelings, being our best self. We've got a lot of strategies tonight. Is there one that you can commit to using immediately? Think about what'll be different for you as a result of using this strategy. If I am my best self more often, what will be different? Be the learner, not the knower. Deep breathing. What's going to be the obstacle that gets in the way of you using the strategy that you chose? So people are saying mindful breathing. Well, what happens when it's been three days and you haven't done your mindful breathing. What's the obstacle? What's going to get in the way of you being the learner, not the knower? And so part of the problem or challenge is that we have to take effective action to tackle the obstacles. Like for me, um, being my best self in the morning with my family is hard because I just have no patience. But I know if I get up a little earlier and have my coffee, okay, I can be my better self parent. I just want to say, as we wrap up our time together, you really owe it to yourself and to your loved ones to use healthy emotion regulation strategies. Um, it is the difference between a very healthy family, a productive, passionate, compassionate family, and a, a family where there's just endless difficulty um, and resentment. So a few last things. One, we have an app that we've built called the Mood Meter app. If you're interested in learning more about that, you can download it there. And let me wrap this and put it all together. First, you gotta give yourself and everyone the permission to feel. I'm gonna urge all of you to be that emotion scientist and not the emotion judge. Remember, emotional intelligence is about using all emotions wisely. I also want to ask you to appreciate that developing these skills can be really hard. Um, it's harder than sometimes the traditional academic skills. That's why I call it life's work. And then finally, be the role model. If you fail, can you be open to apologizing, forgiving, getting the help you need if necessary? So I like to ask everyone to take a nice long inhale and an exhale. Now it's early morning for many of you here in California, it's dinner time. In Connecticut, where I'm at, it's almost 10 o'clock at night. So we got people all over the world, different places, but maybe we can come together right now to just 
digest this information? What resonates with you? What's difficult with you? Can you make that commitment? Are there things that can help you have more clarity? And so I want to end by saying thank you for inviting me, but I also want to end with a quote. It's one of my favorites by Viktor Frankl. And here we go. Think of this in your role as a parent. Between stimulus and response, there is space. And that space is our power to choose our response. In our response lies our growth and our freedom. Okay, thank you very much. And I'm gonna turn it back over to Jen, um, who I just see came back on camera. Um, and Teresa, questions. I know that we've got a quiet group here tonight, so um, maybe it's the- uh, Yeah, well, you know, Mark, story. thank you, right? I, I think we forget, you know, to, to take the time to, to breathe, right? I think that's really important. Kind of in my role as director of parent relations, the start of the school year, it's ringing phones, text messages, and that email ding is yep. just constant sometimes. Okay. And it gets, it does get overwhelming. And sometimes I just have to step away and take a minute or two to just center myself and, and really do that kind of mindful breathing to come back and, and be present. Um, so that was a really, really good reminder to, to, to do that. Um, so I know, you know, what parents are saying, thank you. It's a lot of good information, but again, you know, Dr. Smith and I had some questions while we were listening to the presentation. So we'll direct them to Mark first. And, and sure. as we are asking our questions, you know, don't be shy for, for our families who are, you know, tuning in still to, to put your questions in the chat box and we'll answer right. them. So I think a lot of the strategies you talked about, I think maybe I'm interpreting it wrong, but you know, we are majority a boarding community, right? So for families who aren't able to be together to have that dinner time or family time, like what yeah. are some suggestions to work on these kind of permission to feel strategies you have when you're not physically present, right? Like you're not together in a room, right? Is it a phone call? Is it setting that time? Kind of what can what can boarding parents do that have that geographical challenge um, do to build these skills together? Yeah, well, I think a number of things and we've worked with quite a few boarding schools. You know, when you're having the conversations, you know, I'm not sure about all the policies at your school, but sometimes you send home weeklies and maybe some of those things, you know, parents are not happy about, like, I didn't know that you did this and why did you do that? Does that ever happen in your school? Oh, yeah. Are... yeah, we might send parent updates or, sure. Yeah, so a parent, a parent finds out something about their child that they're unhappy about. I'm sure that happens once in a while. Or a student is having trouble with a roommate or with a, on a sports team, you know, and they're struggling through it. I think everything that I share tonight is applicable, those, especially those four steps, right? So you know, when you're ever you're having the conversation, you just want to start it with being the most present parent and the most being your best self. So it's like, don't, you're gonna get triggered because maybe you're tired or maybe you've had this conversation for the 15th time and you know what? That's what it's like to be a parent or an educator, right? And so the second is um, being the role model with your children when you're on Zoom, when you're on the phone call, when you're you know, sharing the things that are aggravating you, like really saying out loud, like what you're doing to help you, you know, honey, this is really bothering me. I know, you know, this is making me a little bit frustrated or I am a little bit, you know, angry. I'm just gonna let you know that. Um, and so I'm gonna learn a bit more um, and then we're gonna talk through this. Just, you know, be the role model in terms of being self-regulated and not losing it. I, I think that is just absolutely the most important. So I'll ask a question, you know, we have a few senior parents and one of the pieces of the fall is seniors applying to college. And, you know, that often can uh, be a moment of independence for students, but also there's often a lot of um, tension around those conversations. So I wonder if you could just maybe 
talk about how some of what you've talked about tonight could apply to to that space? I mean, I think the first thing, which is probably stating the obvious, is that it's your child essay, not your essay. Sure. Um, and so, you know, I've, gosh, I mean, I've seen so much of this in my years and, you know, the admissions and other things. But I think, you know, most important is, again, am I being emotionally intelligent in the way I am helping my child develop that essay? fill out their application or am I creating a power imbalance? Am I putting the fear of God into my child? Um, you know, there's so much pressure these days that you have to be the best and you've got to be at the best place. And I just want to tell parents that is very misguided. Um, you know, by way of example, I am now, you know, a full professor at a place like Yale, well, not at like Yale, I am at Yale, but um, I was not ready to be a Yale student when I went to college. I just wasn't ready. And so had I jumped into a university with that much pressure, I probably would have completely fallen apart. And so I, I my point here is know your child and don't try to live vicariously through your child. I see mm -hmm. that a lot. And, um, you know, that's about being, you know, giving your child the permission to be who they are um, and managing all of your emotions when they're different than you are in personality. Um, you know, I've seen this all the time where one parent is just like, you know, they were clear about what they wanted with their life. And when they were five years old, they always wanted to be a scientist. They asked for, for a microscope when they were in first grade. And they have a child who is like, you know, I'm not really sure. What do you mean you're not sure? What do you mean you? How could you not be sure? I knew exactly what I wanted to do when I was five years old. And so, um, avoid blaming. You you never want to make your kid feel bad about themselves. At the same time, you don't want to give them a false sense of self-esteem by telling them that everything is fabulous when it's not. I can go on and on about that, obviously. <laughs> Are there other questions that you have, Jen, or from our parents? I was going to ask Mark maybe one more. Like, I guess, you know, you presented to our faculty and staff, which I popped into, but like, how do you see the partnership between like families at home and, and the school environment, right? Like, how do we foster it together, right? Like, I don't think it works if it's just a, a one-sided thing, right? So kind of, you know, how do, how can schools and teachers support kind of the, all the strategies that you're talking about? You know, honestly, it starts with leadership. It starts with all of you. You're the, you know, as the director of parent relations and associate head of school, um, teachers are looking to you as role models, right? So if you're like, you know, you can't regulate for the life of you, you know, it's like, it's hard to have the credibility, right? To do this work. Um, so ruler, which is our model, is about the immune system of the entire school which means it's about how leaders lead, how educators teach, how students learn and how families parent. And what we like to do, which I think is very helpful, is create a common language. So, you know, for example, my book, Permission to Feel, which people have read, I think you're, you guys have ordered that book for your staff yeah. and faculty, right? It's a common language now. Mm -hmm. Everybody knows what the mood reader is. So like if Teresa says, I'm in the red right now, you know what she means, Jen. And that's important because when you have multiple approaches from different grade levels, there's no way to, it's like, there's no cohesion. And so these tools like the moon meter, I think are really helpful. And a parent at right? the head of school, the, you know, the ninth grader, the sports coach and the parent all can talk about emotions in the same way. And that's my goal really to help schools think that way. No, I think that's really helpful, right? That common language that we can identify our, our emotions. Um, so Teresa, the next time you're coming in at red, I'm calling you out on it. <laughs> that's not emotionally. Jed, you just continue to judge, not the scientist. Or I think I'm more the, um, which color is the like overly optimistic most of the time. I once had a teacher tell me like, it's pretty bad for all of us that you're so upbeat all the time. <laughs> so, 
Well, that's what, you know, it's interesting you say that because, you know, it can be off putting for people, right? Yeah. Because I'm an introvert, for example, people think of me as outgoing, but I'm very shy, actually. Um, I can do I can be social, but I'm not like into it. <laughs> and so when I'm around people who are really high energy people like, let's go to the sports bar. I'm like, are you kidding me? A sports bar? I'd, be, I'd rather, you know, I want to go to the wine bar. <laughs> um, and I say that just because um, for me, being around all the yellow energy is overwhelming. Now, on the other hand, someone who is more prone to be like in the yellow quadrant, when they're around me for a long time, they're like, Mark, like another yoga class? Come on, can we do something a little bit more? <laughs> And so I think as a teacher, as a parent, as a leader, you have to be aware of kind of where you live emotionally mm -hmm. and know that that may not be where everybody else lives and be flexible. Yeah, that's a great point. I think that's kind of a great comment to end on, right? Don't you yeah. agree, Teresa? Kind of recognizing your own emotions and the energies we give off of each other, right? So any kind of last minute wrap up remarks, Dr. Smith, before we say goodbye and we wrap up a very kind of busy 48 hours we've had on campus and with our families? Yeah, I, I'm just really grateful to you. I read your book this summer and it was, I thought, a perfect combination for us of coming out of the pandemic and really thinking carefully about how we're all feeling. There's some great parts of your book that talk about you know, all of our students being able to be themselves at school. And, you know, that's been a huge focus of, for us in our DEI efforts and, you know, just just kind of having a lot of attention to that. So um, I encourage parents who haven't read it to pick up a copy. I'm happy to lend mine out as well. And um, thank you so much for coming in and being with us during our, of our weekend. I hope you have a wonderful school year and um, good to be with you. And thank you for inviting me into your school's world. Thank you. Sure. All right, great. Thanks, everyone. I hope you have a good evening or a good morning where you are. So again, if you're interested, go get Mark's book. It's also available in many, many languages. So if you're more comfortable kind of reading in your home language, we encourage you to do that. Um, and we're always here to, to listen, right? So if you read the book and you have a quick thought, feel free to email myself or Dr. Smith or your students' advisors. We're happy to have that conversation with you, right? I think reading alone and processing this is not as much fun when you can share your, your feelings with others. Um, so again, good to see you guys and we hope to see you soon. Bye. You. Have a good evening. Bye. Thanks all.